Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So it's a great pleasure to uh, introduce George. Uh, George is an old friend. I, if you don't know George, he's a, um, I think you'll find, a master expositor, fantastic teacher. And uh, uh, he wrote an amazing book that I recommend to everybody called Network Algorithmics. Uh, it's, it's organized in a, in, a, in a really special way around principles. And, and it, it's not like any other networking book out there that I've ever seen. Um, and, you know, George is known for uh, uh, lots of mechanisms that are implemented in, in every switch, like uh, Deficit Round Robin. Uh, he founded a company, um, NetSift, which uh, was acquired by Cisco and, uh, you know, did the worm detection and stuff that uh, got into uh, Cisco's gear. So uh, George has had a huge impact on the networking industry, both in education and in uh, real products. So it's. Uh, this particular problem he's going to talk about is super dear to our hearts here at Microsoft. We know we are, we, uh, we, uh, this uh, performance isolation is something that, that Azure absolutely has to solve. And uh, um, any data center, uh, enterprise data center as well, um, has to solve. When they, um, so it's, and you know, there's, there's work on it in MSR, there's work on it um, in UCSD, and we, we're really, it, it's super timely and uh, uh, really keen to find out uh, how George uh, attacks the problem. Thanks, George. Thanks. Thank you, Albert. Yeah. So uh, I'm afraid uh, <laughs> I'm this. I have only 15 to 20 slides, so we'll try to. <laughs> I, 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 uh, I, I should have probably made a few more, but I, I ran out of time with all the things I was trying to do. So I'll, I'll try, and uh, I think the basic ideas will be clear. And uh, where I forgot the experiments, I'll, I have the paper here, so I'll, I'll, I'll go back and say, remember what the parameters were. I'll be groping at the, at the graphs and say, now what was that? So, so we'll, we'll figure it out together, though. Okay. So, uh, so I guess the problem is uh, very simple conceptually, right? We'd like to virtualize data center networks across services. So the setting that we address, which is somewhat different from the Azure one, so I want to make sure that uh, you understand our setting, is one for enterprise data centers. Right? So enterprise data centers, as a, so I would, what, what people sometimes call private clouds as opposed to public clouds. Okay? So a private cloud, like let's say uh, FedEx or Pfizer, typically has been sold the, the vision that instead of keeping all your departments having separate servers, right? like you have engineering, accounting, because of VMs, right, you should be able to save a lot of money by consolidating your servers. Right? So that's the trend that we know VMware and various other VMware, VMware. <coughs> So that's happening, right? And but then when you see that happening, also storage is also being you know somewhat virtualized because you can have you know you, a given physical disk can always be partitioned and broken up among people. So uh, but now you're beginning to see things, and if you look a little carefully into the trade press, you'll see these things where people are seeing that during times of VM backups, right, or strange things are happening, these VMs are interfering with each other. Right? So in some sense, the network, you know, virtualization means many things, and you have to define what it means. Right? But one, imp one, uh, one, one kind of instinctive meaning is separation. You would like these things to separate. And so really, the goal we are trying to address here is trying to actually build what is known as what you might, people have called a virtual data center. Right? So what's a data center? You have you know, resources like CPU, you know, like uh, disk, and memory. And then you also have a network. Right? In some sense, people have made good solutions to memory, disk, and, uh, and processing. Right? And so we would like to really define what it might mean to share a network. Okay, and so part of this talk, and, and this is all very early work. Balaji has been doing work. Albert and Srikant and uh, Ming have been doing work. So I think everybody is groping for a definition. So don't, don't, don't take any of this very seriously. You might come up with a better definition, but at least you have to start somewhere. Okay? So, so that's the context for this talk. All right. So. Uh, uh, so, uh, so yeah. So, so definitely, modern data centers are built at very large scale. There are thousands of servers. They concurrently execute a large number of applications, right? And 
so <clears throat> people are already virtualizing resources to reduce costs rather than have a data center for engineering, a data center for, for accounting. And, uh, and they really like this because you also have agility because you can move your data center, your, your, your VMs around. Okay, so that's kind of nice. And so you have all these existing technologies which we've talked about, Zen, there are SANS for storage, and, uh, <laughs> and the, there are various people are, are, are fooling around with memory too. And, uh, and really a lot of this is about resources on a single machine, right? So the interesting thing that we'd like to look at is, is bandwidth. And, and now what you have to do is divide it across a set of links. So look at VMware, right? Uh, if you take your single server and you often, I think Amazon has some number like say 10, right? 10 VMs. So 10 VMs are allocated, but it's pretty easy to see the model, right? In the worst case, if all 10 VMs are, are actually active at the same time, very unlikely, right? You'll get one tenth of the CPU. If none of them are active, right? You, you'll get actually all of the CPU, but actually they tend to not be a little alarmed by you getting all of the CPU and playing games. So they tend to have some limit on how much CPU you'll get. So they won't give you all. So they'd have a min guarantee and a max guarantee. So that's a, some kind of guidance as to the way people, but that's on one machine. Right? Imagine now you had to do it across multiple machines, so it's not, you have to kind of define what it means. And so, uh, so now is bandwidth a bottleneck? So I guess from VL2, we, these are numbers from VL2, I guess, uh, or I, I think, I don't know where, uh, 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 I, I should have credited it, but uh, so this is uh, this, uh, some slides that uh, Terry made up. And so, so there's lots and lots of traffic between the servers and the data center. Right? There is stuff leaving and entering, so we are really worried about the bandwidth within the data center. Okay, so uh, the outside stuff, we're not talking about ISPs, we're not talking about the outside stuff. And so, uh, and I guess, uh, uh, so the network may be a bottleneck for computation, at least that's an axiom that we are going to hold for here. Okay, and so certainly, I, I, you know, with a little bit of Googling, you'll find these examples of little disturbing signs where people are saying, oh, I virtualized everything, and my app was doing just fine, and suddenly the other guy's apps, VM started backing up, and I got, I got, I, I, I took a hit. And so people are beginning to see this. So, so, all right. So, so basically, we would like to have uh, this notion of bandwidth virtualization, where, uh, and I think uh, you can think in terms of Microsoft, for example, right? You have a bunch of properties. You have things like uh, Bing. You have, uh, you know, like uh, <laughs> what do you have? Uh, you have <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. Uh, email, what is, what is it called? MSN, uh, Hotmail, sorry, I, I don't use these things. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm on record too here. <laughs> Victor's looking at me. And yeah, so um, I, you know, I'm so used to using one of your competitors' examples that I had to you know, really keep uh, groping for the, for the names. Right, so you have a bunch of properties. And so you would like to give each property uh, or the application the illusion of owning a virtual data center, separate CPU done, disk done, memory done, and the network is needed. Okay, so that's, uh, now one of the most important things we believe in, and it's a little arguable, right, is that we believe that you want, you want, you, need, you would like to have statistical multiplexing of the network bandwidth. If you don't want it, it's really easy, right? Go and reserve on everything, and you know, with some extent, reservations are possible. People know how to do it, right? You know, you can just reserve bandwidth on every link. But when you start trying to statistically multiplex, the game becomes more challenging, right? So we kind of know how to do it in a single link. There's something called fair queuing. But to do it across multiple links, you know, you need a definition first of all, right? Yes. I'm just going to ask, you list a couple of resources up here that need to be virtualized. Do you think that's the complete list? Do you put more power on that list? No, I, it's not the complete list at all. It's a good, good point, right? So power, power sounds like a good one. Battery, right? Because you might be using, uh, uh, you know, like an equal amount of CPU as another app, but you might be using a lot more power. It's not at all clear that those two are. Generally, I think the assumption is when you go with, I mean, it may be a simplifying assumption that if you use the same amount of disk and memory and CPU that you're probably using the same amount of power as something else. If given that simplifying assumption, maybe not. So if power is an indirect measure that is sort of derived from all some of these things, maybe it's possible to work. But you're right, this is not a complete list. But this is the first cut list that one would think, right? So, but power is a very interesting one. Right? How do you divide your battery? <laughs> so. Uh, so, so I guess we really would like statistical multiplexing, and if you look at disks, clearly you don't statistically multiply. You don't, you don't have somebody stomping on somebody else's disk. When they're not using it, you write into their bits. No, that's not possible, right? But, but certainly it's true for, 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 for VMs, right? When one VM is not running, the other VM can you know, get at least some of the CPU that the other one has, right? So go ahead. So the resources here need not be independent, right? I mean, unless you're using offloading like tricks. So if you give, you know, 
vary the amount of CPU allocation, memory disk allocation, then the amount of network activity per VM will also be affected. So it's not, so they're not completely independent. I agree, I agree. But I think what we'd like to do is to sort of give a, a property the, that, that it has a certain minimum amount of bandwidth, and maybe if they're lucky, they'll get up to a certain max. So, okay. Okay, so with all of this, right, so what's our, uh, uh, so why is bandwidth virtualized? Because now you have to do it across multiple ways, okay? So now you have all these QoS mechanisms, right? And it's, it's sort of, they look like they kind of solve the problems, but, uh, so there is things called router scheduling, where what happens is you can do these mechanisms by which you can give, you a, give somebody a fair share of one link. Right? So you take a link, and uh, today I think uh, many routers will basically allow you to uh, write a classifier, and then trap, and you can map it onto a certain number of buckets, maybe 100, maybe you know, 10, 20, and all those guys can be given a share of a link. Right? And you can give them weights, and so you can have two-fifths of the link, I can have one-fifth of the link. But now you have to do it across multiple links, and you sort of have a, and um, it turns out that, uh, so you know it's really confusing because there's tons of work, right? So there's traffic engineering, and but uh, so what does traffic engineering do? In some sense, traffic engineering is actually, and Srikanth is, you know, uh, certainly we spent a lot of time reading a lot of papers, including his. And as far as I understand it, it does a better job of routing admitted traffic, right? It doesn't really have this notion of allocating across multiple things. So. For example, if there's a DOS attack that comes into your network, traffic engineering will do its best to route it on the least or on better utilized parts, but it doesn't prevent it and from taking over the share of other people. So, yes? When you talk about allocated bandwidth, do you mean a statically allocated slice or you dynamically? You're good dynamic. That's why we want statistical multiplexing, right? So it's not a static. Okay. Yes. So we'll come to the model in a second. So after all, this is general topic, <coughs> right? Okay, so let's start with the model, right? So what is our model? Okay. So, this is draw this network, right, which is uh, a physical network and very simple, right, two-tier network where there are four switches at the bottom and there's one core switch. Right? We can make it more complicated, but let's start with it. So now let's also have these different properties, right, which are colored. So you have A1, which is the green property, which has, which has a VM here and a VM here. A2 has a VM here, here, and here, and A3 has a VM here. Right? So they kind of overlap in some strange ways. So I'm going to assume that whenever I show something like this, that the pair, all pairs want to communicate. So this, the, the, on this machine, uh, on, so by, by the way, these are the switches, so I haven't drawn the machines. But it means a machine here running A1 wants to communicate with the machine here running A1. But in the case like A2, you, you have one connection between these two machines and one connection between these two machines. Does that make sense? Is this picture clear? Because uh, I, I haven't drawn the host to keep it simple to clutter. I've only drawn the edge switches and the core switches. All right? So now, though, so the, I would like to have some kind of manager sort of decide some kind of weights. The green guy is four times as important as the, and the blue and red are equally important. You know how? How do you do that? Okay? So I think weights are very important because uh, if you talk about properties, right, a very natural way to allocate bandwidth is by revenue, right? How much they, if you don't have properties, if you, you can, if, if, if you have even engineering accounting, companies are very familiar with cost accounting, right? It's a very natural way to say, you know, okay, you know, you want more, you know, you pay more in an internal cost accounting sense. So you need some kind of lever, right, where you have to, and we, we're looking for the simplest possible lever, right? We don't want a lot of bells and whistles, but a simple weight. But this is weights across the network. Right? So what does it mean? Right? It's not entirely clear how, how these guys share. So let's, let's, take, let's take the example. Right? So imagine that, uh, that A1 would, and all of them want to send at full throttle. Right? They just want to dump into the network. All connections would have enough data to send. They're all trying to complete you know, some big map reduce job. Well, uh, let's start with this link over here. Right? So when you take this link, right? A, the only com competitors are A1 is trying to send one here, and A2 is trying to send one here, correct? Right? But what happens is that they have, uh, they have uh, w because they have, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I, I screwed up actually. This should have been uh, <coughs> the, um, uh, right, okay. So uh, no, maybe this is right. So what, when, when they compete, right, they, they share in the ratio four is to one, right? So therefore, this guy should get eight, Right. What, so what we'd like to do is decompose this picture into a green network, a purple network, and a, a, and, and a red network. And we'd like to give bandwidth labels to each. That's a simple model. It's not the best model because we're not hiding topology. Okay? But we are exposing locality. 
And at least currently in data centers, there's a huge difference between local bandwidth and so maybe it's an advantage to actually keep a slightly more complex model. Now, people don't like to actually expose topology to customers, right? But remember, we're not talking about the Azure environment yet. We're talking about enterprise data centers. So it's not as unreasonable to expose your topology to enterprise data centers. But in the Azure environment, you might say, you know, do you want customers to have the exact view of our topology? Because, you know, they could attack it and stuff like that. But for now, let's just finesse that. Right, go ahead. I was going to ask about that, actually. Yeah. The question I have is, so we hear a lot about <coughs> oversubscribed networks and yeah. customers want to keep all traffic in the rack and customers being aware yeah. that the racks are on the same axe switch or yeah. Yeah. different parts of the tree. Yeah. So are we assuming some VL2-like network here where no. these things go away? No. No. Or? No. I'm just, uh, I think we're somewhat orthogonal to all of that, but we're definitely not assuming that. We would like to work regardless of the underlying network model. So, so for example, if there is, you know, rack, much more bandwidth in the rack than there is elsewhere, then we want to expose that, right? But we want to expose your share of that so that you see it independently of other people. Yes? One potential concern with this model is that there's tremendous non-uniformity in how much bandwidth each particular uh, instance of an application or me member of a tenant exactly. would get based on who's co-located with them. So if you look at the purple in the middle, yep, yep. that guy gets 2G, that, that VM might have 2G of connectivity, whereas an equivalent A2 VM sitting on A3 only gets 1G just because of who else happened to be placed on, on the same VM right. with them. I think the, the, general, the general thing I would do to avoid that would be if there's a few properties, right, you're guaranteed on every link, right, at least this share of, of, of your bandwidth. So for example, if there's 411, right, you're guaranteed, if you're a four person, you're guaranteed at least four six if there are only three applications, regardless of where people are. So if you want to move people around, you have some kind of floor that is actually totally independent of where people are. I see, I see. Yeah. Yes. So in this model, I mean, yeah. that means you have to get your weights end to end <coughs> from each instance of the VM on every system. No, the weights are assigned to the application. Think of it like, you know, like, you know, like the property, like search gets a weight four and uh, email gets weight one. So the, the, the applications actually don't even know any of this, except that there's some, the model is that you, there's some identifier in a packet, like a port number or something that identifies the, uh, the application, right? And so that can be mapped to weights somewhere. And in this model, the VMs will migrate. They could migrate and that would be fine. But right? then that would mean that you have to reload reconverge your proportions rate? Right? We, we will reconverge the bandwidth allocations, but you're, there's a certain minimum bandwidth you get regardless of where you are, right? On, you have, you can, you think of, in some sense, you get a certain proportion of every link, right? But the actual numbers, now we're going to, the statistical multiplexing is going to vary tremendously, depending on where you're co-located, who's act, that's true anyway, right? It's, even if it, these guys are not co-located, it really depends on how much this guy is using it, right? If this guy is empty, you get the, all of the attend gate. So we know that anyway. So, so migration is just another piece of dynamism that affects the statistical multiplexing gains, right? So you have a minimum and a maximum. Is this true for compute for uh, virtualization or storage virtualization? I think for compute there is, but not for storage, right? So compute, for example, if the other VMs are not active, you can go up to the top. Now, what we really think we also will have to do in such a model, right, is we also have to enforce a max. So even though, for example, on this link, the 10 gig link, if the, if the, if the, if the purple was not there, this guy could get the entire 10, right, uh, which is what statistic, we probably want to, allow this, the, 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 the administrator of the network to configure a lower max, because otherwise people play games. And as, maybe not in the enterprise, but at least in the Azure environment, you probably want, you, you want some max, which is easy. It's just a rate controller. All right. So, but I haven't really talked about the model. Okay. So, so now what happens is that, so let's assume that this guy, right, this purple guy, ha, sorry, the, the green guy has, uh, uh, let's see. Uh, so, the, so the purple guy gets to, on, on this link, right, he basically gets 2 gig because when he's sharing this link with this other guy, he's, he's a 4 to 1 ratio, so he gets 2 gig. But now it's a little more complicated, right? He has two connections, one going like this and one going like this, right? So because remember, I assume that there's a pair of connections between each machine. So the assumption that we are going to make is that every pair, whenever you have multiple connections within the same application, they share equally. Okay, so now this is an important distinction because what we're trying to say is even if an app opens up many, many connections, right, it gets the same share, but it's completely dependent on this. And that's really important because today we know that in Hadoop, and by simply increasing the number of slaves or the number of masters, right, you can get a tremendous number of TCP connections and you'll get an unfair share of bandwidth. 
So that's not happening, right? We first, we're going to take off the top based on the weights, and, but then within that, we don't want to differentiate your connections. It's just too much work, right? We could if you wanted to, but now we have to sort of explicitly say for each of your TCB connections, what's their weights? And you could add that to the model, but it's messy, right? It's messy not from implementation, but just from specification, because you'll have to sort of specify every pair of VMs and what they're trying to do, and we're trying to avoid all of that in the model, okay? So, so this guy gets one gig, and now here's an interesting thing that happens. When this guy gets one gig over here, if you look at, at this link over here, right, the red guy is sharing it with, with this, but he's only sharing it with one of these connections, but that connection is limited to one gig, so the red guy can go all the way to nine. So this uh, is it's a famous thing that m many of you will have heard of. It's, called, it's actually called max-min fair, max fair sharing, which max-min means that if you're bottleneck somewhere, like this guy, right, even though on this link, you're actually equal weights. You and the red guy are equal weights. And you would think you should be given five. It's like, why? I'm limited to one anyway elsewhere, so why not be generous and give it to, don't be a dog in the manger, give it, give it to the other guy. And so this guy gets nine. Okay, so there is actually a slightly recursive calculation where you have to find the bottleneck and then find, you know, share that one, and then that sort of suggests other bottlenecks. And, and so there's, there's something to be calculated, but it's automatically done. It's very well known in the literature. But however, this is what we would call hierarchical maximum fair share. Okay, so what is hierarchical? First, we do maximum fair sharing based on the properties, the colors. Then we, once that has been decided, then you do maximum fair sharing within the connections assuming equal weights. Okay, so it's, it's a two-step process. Yes? This will have to be recalculated. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Although there's a certain minimum bandwidth that I, I was telling Dave that will happen regardless. So you'll be guaranteed regardless of where people move because you know, fundamentally, if you take your weight divided by the sum of the weights of everybody, right, there is a certain ratio you're guaranteed. So there's a floor you have. So you can't be completely knocked out of the network. Yes? So, okay, well, uh, so um, going back to what I was, was asking, uh, I'm thinking about the application characteristics and I'm thinking about this being in, independent of, of what you do with the computes. Yes. So if you, if you don't have the same sort of uh, models for the compute, you might get a you know, portion. So let's say, let's take an extreme case that you allocate 411 here and you allocate uh, something like 2, uh, you know, whatever, uh, 2, 4, uh, 2, 3, 1, right? So here we are assuming the allocation is on a network wide basis. So, 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 not, so what I mean, uh, if, if, if your computes are not matched, are not in sync with what the network bandwidth you've actually allocated, then you could get into a situation where you're actually not exploiting uh, the benefits of Stuff, right? yeah. So I think there are a number of design, once you, ex this is a bunch of mechanisms, right? how you use them is always a very interesting, like given a certain compute requirement, how do you map it onto a certain weight? But remember the weights are, are across the network. We're trying to keep the model as simple as possible because generally our experience with things is, you know, Cisco weighted red, per this thing, per app, nobody uses those knobs, it's just too complicated, right? So, you know, it's, the router vendors keep putting in more and more knobs, but the network administrators don't touch them for the most part. So we're just trying to give a very simple knob, right? You have like, you know, 10 properties, and and just give me the weights. I was sort of wondering that to benefit that, you actually have to have. So you have to have a design thing about, on top of it. Across, not just a I agree. Yeah, yeah. And then you might ask the questions how, where should I migrate my VMs? What is the right way? But those are questions that come on top of this. So, first, you have to give some mechanism, I think, to start with, right? Some form of control. Yes? Hey, even in a network case, right? I mean, since you could have uh, time multiplexing between you know, A2 and A3, so such you, if you have burstiness, right? Yes. So, burst of A2 can actually can come, yes. and you should have, you should be able to give it. It's, if, if A3 is actually you know, not using that. Uh, right. At, and that's exactly the next slide, right? That's exactly the next slide. So the next slide is now what happens is, uh, so what happens is that, that A1 to A, this guy is not, not burst, he, he's, he's not using the full, he's only using six gig, right? When that happens, this guy gets four gig on this link, right? By the allocation, that's, that's what we desire. We haven't shown you the mechanisms yet. And therefore, two gig here, right? And therefore, this guy goes down to eight. So, but there is a recursive sort of uh, coupling here, yes? I'm trying to understand in the blue network yeah. why the two left nodes have different allocations. Well, this is the homologically identical. Yeah, yeah. This is the sum of both of them, right? So you, you're right. So this is the sum of so both connections, right? So there are two connections, one going here and one going here, both of 2G. But there are also two from the left one. 
Yeah, going to the middle and the right. Yeah, the, I don't understand why it's you know, the left and the right. Point. I probably didn't calculate it right, so I, I, I may not have done the calculations right. I was trying to do this a few minutes before, and so, <laughs> right. So I, I think I'm not assuming a connection from here to here, right? If there was, then I would, I, I would have to chain these numbers. Sorry, you're right. The pressure symmetry, yeah. yeah. So, so, so I think they worked out correctly in the paper, but when I try, I, every time I do these examples, I get them wrong, so I, I apologize. Yeah. So, so I wasn't seeing what was repressive, but can't you just figure out these caps uh, pairwise? And the no. No, what happens is the, it's, there's this sort of, uh, the way it works is uh, you first find the, the bottleneck link, the one that has the minimum weighted, uh, divided by the weight, right, is, is the smallest. And then once that happens, you know, like uh, that restricts certain flows, right? But then those flows then cause new, have new bottlenecks. And then so you have to keep, it's, it's a very standard algorithm. I, I can tell you about it. It's, it's classical and, you know, studied for 20 years now. Right. So it's called a water filling algorithm where you start trying to do this, go to the bottleneck, find that. Oh, so and what you're saying is you can't do this in, let's say, two parallel runs. No, you can't do okay. two parallel runs. Right? You have to actually, it's, it's, uh, it's, 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 in worst case, it can be E sequential steps where E is the number of edges. But in practice, it's the diameter. In practice, there's only a few bottlenecks, so it doesn't work. We've done it in centralized fashion too. Yes? So every time, say, a certain link doesn't use the capacity, yes. and your bottleneck increases or decreases? Yes. Or Let's talk about, we'll talk about all the trade-offs. So uh, once we get to the mechanisms, we'll see, you know, various ones will have different latency. And stuff. Okay. So, uh, okay. So now with this, or with this as, so I guess the first thing is, so let's talk about three mechanisms that you're going to do, right? And one of them is going to be something called group allocation, which is really, so now let's talk about our goals, right? What can we change? Now, I think if you're Microsoft, and hopefully this is, uh, you know, like this is a willing audience to hear this, right? You really can't go around necessarily assuming that the routers will change. Because, you know, that's Cisco, and yes, you might be able to convince them, but it's, you know, and maybe you have friends in Broadcom, but it still takes a while for this. So ideally, you would like to do this with no router changes, right? Now, Balaji, when he came here, actually talked about a mechanism that sort of is modified QCM. And there he's assuming that he can change the switches. Right. So, so remember, one clear point of distinction between his work and ours is we're not going to assume that the routers can change. Okay. Now, we also would like not to not to go ahead and configure uh, to to add software to the host. I mean, some of our proposals we're going to add software. To the okay, but Microsoft is probably okay with that, right? But certain other people might find that hard. So, our first thing is called group allocation, and it's going to leverage TCP's behavior. It requires no software hardware changes, but it does require configuration in routers. So that even that was hard for for the Azure folks, right? And and it's going to converge very fast. So, talk about the trade-offs. It's going to converge in a few routers. It's basically TCP speeds, right? Another Thing called rate throttling, which says, ah, that, that works only based on TCP. And I have to tell you all of these. And so if you want to do this, right, you're going to have to do some kind of measurement and some kind of external, and you have to add software in the host. And this is going to be a few milliseconds just to measure that there's a problem. Okay. And finally, we have a much more weird thing, which is a centralized allocator, where, like RCP and all, which are route, centralized route control things, we're going to do everything, including bandwidth allocation in centralized fashion. And this is going to be slow because, in general, you have to see probably in the order of hundreds of milliseconds, right, or tens of maybe. So, so this is a set of trade-offs, and we'll try to show you that this one is the easiest, right, and fastest, but it requires some assumptions, right, and it only gives you one definition. This one can handle UDP as well. This one can handle everything in the kitchen sink, but, but it's complicated. You know, you have to do a certain amount of work. So there's a set of trade-offs that, that get this. All right. Okay, so let's start with this picture. Okay, so maybe some of this stuff about the, the definitions will come a little more clear here. So now I've forgotten about the data center topology. I'm not trying to bother you to draw switches and you know, try to draw some simple topologies that I can understand, right? and not every pair. So there's a host one and a host four. There's an edge switch, core switch. So you can actually, if you want, mentally move, you know, twist all this thing into the right shape, but, but I can do this this way. And there's a host one and a host two and a host four and a host three. Okay? So let me see what the problem is. So, so the idea is that very simple. Uh, there is a famous paper, which some of you may have read, but it's very old, so I'm not sure the new graduate students have read. I'm sure Shrikant has read this. Basically, there's a paper by Ellen Hahn, right, in many years ago, which said, do you remember when this is? Uh, uh, Hans, uh, so, so this is, uh, she was Gallagher's student, right? And she basically said, look, if you do, uh, okay, first of all, right, why doesn't window flow control, why doesn't just uh, simple fair queuing work? Okay, so let's, let's just see, let, let, me, let me see if I can have an example where I hope I'll remember. So what happens is that imagine that 
uh, I have one, one, one color, the, or one which is using, uh, uh, and this is a 10, a 10 megabit link, and, and suppose one guy is using, uh, has a weight of four, right? And another guy here is, uh, and there's somebody over here who wants to go in over here, right? Now, uh, okay, so there are three colors, or there are three, there are three properties. One, one has one connection here, one has one connection going this way, and a third one going here. So imagine this property has a weight of four, so that limits this end-to-end -end flow to a, to, a rate of, to a rate of two, right? Because out, out of this 10, you get four-fifths of, of that rate. So, so therefore, you should normally be limited to two here, so therefore this other guy should get eight. Correct. That's the that's a desired approach. Now suppose you just simply used router configuration and used DRR, and you basically said of these guys, this guy gets four times the other one. So you'll indeed get the right division on this leg. You'll get two and ten. But if you don't do anything, right, this guy is going to send way too fast on this link and, and actually make sure that it's five and five. Although all his packets are being dropped here. So simple router-based deficit round robin or fair queuing. It works, but it's wasteful because what could happen is the sender could go ahead and say, you know, forget it. You know, I'm just going to send at maximum rate, and I'll be throttled at every link. But the bottleneck, I'll finally be throttled to my right rate. But I'm going to waste bandwidth on all the pre preceding links. Now, most some of you will be thinking, but that can't happen if the sender is TCP. And you're right. And that's really Hans' intuition, right? And so Hans' intuition said basically that if you take any window-based flow control, right, and fair queuing at the routers, you get maximum fair share. A lot of assumptions, you know, hard proof, you know, like, and, but it's not, it's not hierarchical maximum fair share. So we can't directly use that theorem. So basically all we're trying to say is that if you, if you just do this, you actually do get hierarchical. And if you do fair queuing, not by individual connections, but by the properties at each router, then you will get exactly the definition we want. We'll get hierarchical maximum fair. So it's sort of, you get it for free. You don't have to do anything. It's actually an embarrassing result because it's like saying, do nothing, use existing stuff and TCP and everything, you get the right model. Right? So it's, it's appealing from an engineering point of view. It's not very appealing when you write a paper, right? So it's like, because people say, all right, then, then leave. You know, so, okay. so, so let's start with A1 here. This, this is FYI, you know, even in sort of wireless days, the problem which is now sort of uh, thought of as a uh, parking lot problem. Yes. And it's kind of the very same thing. Yes. Exactly the same thing. So if you're climb, climb close to, uh, as, as, as for example, cars are coming in different streets, and you're all going uh, in one direction, so the guy in the, the very end, Totally right. Unless you do emission control at each one of these things. So what happens if you do emission control exactly at the application? So right. that's also pretty well studied. Right, these are very well studied problems, right? The only twist here is that, so I said this theorem is like 20 years old, right? The twist here is that we are moving it to a hierarchical sense. And the only thing we're saying is make sure that you don't do this on a per connection basis, the fair queuing here, but you do it on a property basis. So it means every, so if you have 10 connections going in from search, right? All of them will be treated in the same DRR queue. And that's, that's the only thing you have to do. If you do that, you'll get the definition we want. Okay, so, so what happens is that, uh, let's see, that uh, uh, there, are, there are two properties here, and let's assume they have equal weights, I guess, and uh, so what happens here? So, and there is this guy, and so the, there's a four to one ratio. So clearly A1, now uh, let's look at the time scale at which this happens, right? If both these guys start, the greens and the reds start at the same time, right? as long as you have a DRR like scheduler at the router here, Right, which they do, that is basically giving four times the packets from the red than the green when it's going on in this outbound link, right? It's immediately, this guy's going to get eight. Does that make sense? It doesn't, there's no time constant at all. This is like even less than, micro, it's less than round trip delays. It's in microseconds, right? So, so that, that's done. But when that's done, what happens is that as soon as that is done, then the, at, at some point, what's going to happen is this TCP is going to stop, no, it's going to sense that there is less bandwidth. It's going to go ahead and, but it's also sharing that two with this other TCP, the H2 TCP to, H, to H4, and so they're eventually going to go down to 1-1. One, one. Right, so it just, you, the, the right result automatically happens and you don't have to do a whole lot. What's happening now? Okay, what did I do wrong? Okay, oh well, go ahead. Longer flows, right? Yeah. Not, not really, right? Because these would only take a few round trip delays for this to happen. But I mean, there have been plenty of results which say that TCP takes a while to converge when you have multiple links which are, I mean, in this case, I guess if there's one bottleneck, 
So depending on the number of bottlenecks, I agree, I agree. So it, it's exactly like that. It turns out that the regular maximum fair share calculation, it moves from bottleneck to bottleneck. So there's a, there's a factor which is the number of bottlenecks. Okay. Generally, you don't assume there's that many, especially in the data set. I would say maybe, you know, there's the uplinks and maybe, maybe one or two. So it shouldn't be a problem, right? The few round-trip delays, I think, is right. Sorry, you had a question? Yeah? So this still has the same uh, kind of weird problem that if there are two leaks coming down from H2, yes. then they're each going to get one half. No. Okay, let's, so if there are two links coming down from H2 to this router, yeah. no. Because you're doing it based on green versus red, not based on, oh, so if there are two connect, two, you mean, uh, off, 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 the green, off the green share. Right. Yeah. So will, Definitely. Would they each get one third or would you have one, one half, one half? No. Okay, so let's start. So you want, you want two links coming down and is there another TCP connection coming down? So H2 is opening up a second connection to H4. Right? So first, the, the, the router scheduling mechanism is still going to take eight for this guy. So two is left over for the green. Now that there are three connections he opens up, tough, he gets two third, two third, two third. So your connections are not going to affect the other properties. That's important. You open up more connections, you, you know, you, they divide, that's your problem. If you're certainly your whole, now you can argue in a VM world, you might want to do further limiting on a VM basis as well. Right. So the, well, and you may, may also want to be able to control the, the relative rates of your own flows. You may want to control the relative rates of your own flows, right. So, so we, we, we have simple extensions by which we can do that, but it's just, it's, it's extra complexity. And we're always afraid of, you know, anything that, that complicates the model. So you could say certain, uh, between certain pairs of hosts, you want to give it more weights, right? And, and uh, yeah. So in fact, some of the next things we, we will allow us to do that. All right. So now, so far though, so this problem though is certainly going to be true for a UDP host, right? Because he doesn't care. He's going to just dump over here and steal away the five. Now you can argue maybe it doesn't matter because nobody deserved it anyway. You know, they paid for their shares. So, but there's something, you know, a bit ghastly about a UDP person who is going to be dropped later, right? Not doing something. Okay, so, so now there's tons of work on TCP friendly mechanisms that try to make, but we try to do something very simple, right? So, so this is uh, actually the idea of a student called Siva. And and it's a very simple idea. So basically what he said was you do the same thing, right? And uh, now you have the same thing and so it's eight. And uh, so, so, what, so the problem is what if A2 is uh, A2, the green guy is UDP. So if you don't do it right, right, what he's going to do is he's going to go ahead and transmit as fast as possible and take five out of this link. Right, and as opposed to, he's only getting he's only getting one here. Right, he should be sending at one, but he's going to take five, and all his packets are going to be dropped at this route. So, how do you prevent that kind of behavior? Right. So, in order to do that, right. So, the idea would be that the receiver you, you have to put some kind of shim layer here. Okay. So, where would it be? It would have to be you know somewhere between in the somewhere between the network and uh, and and the and 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 the, and the UDP layer, some something that is intercepting the packets and measuring the rate. Right? And so basically, he's going to measure the rate he's going to send back, and he's going to feed it back to this guy. And so the intuition is, this guy must be sending at five to cause trouble here. But if the receiver is measuring one, why is he going at one? You know, so if you can enforce that, then you, that, that's the intuition. Go ahead. I'm getting a lot of wireless flashbacks here. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, me too. So, so why are we using like back pressure <laughs> or something uh, between the routers? Because we don't want to change the routers. Right? So this is important. Our constraints are, are, are heavy, right? So if you can change anything, lots of things become easy when you can change the router. We have a very constrained playing field, right? Cisco routers, who knows when they're going to change? And you know, for something like this, you know, like you have to make a very good. So if you can do it without any changes, that's the best. So back pressure works in a line, but doesn't work very well in mesh. Yeah. yeah. That's, yeah. So, so this is a very. Uh, um, well, you. It turns out that you know the, the, the you know QCN and all these guys they have methods, right? But so it's it is complicated though. But I'd, I'd rather finesse that argument for now by saying, look, the rules of the game is we can't touch those switches, right? You may be able to touch the L2 switches, but you can't touch the L3 switches, and the congestion could occur anywhere. So it's like you know, let's try and do it without changing, without changing the internal network. And again, one of the fundamental differences here is, is most wireless routing is done in software because the link speeds are so low. This kind of routing is being done in hardware ASICs because it's 10 gigabits, right? So, so you're not running a general purpose program for your friend that comes in. Yeah, so that, that's very important because our experience with when we went to NetSip, we thought, ah, oh, you know, this is so. They, they would, they, they said finally, all right, first it takes six months out of arguing before they agree to put a feature in, right? Then it takes 
two years for somebody like Cisco to build an ASIC. Why? Because one and a half years is half half a year is spent on design. One and a half years is spent on testing. Because an ASIC is so expensive, you can't afford to. So, so now two years later, you think it's all done, but it's not. Then they decide to put it on a board, right? And once they put, so the real number is like five years for any any new thing to come. It's, it's shocking, right? It's it's terrifying. It's like by the time you lose interest in a feature, right, then it might come in, right? So it's uh, so it's really scary. To the, I mean, you're talking of doing nothing for five years, and and think of the the effort of socializing this about not just Cisco but Juniper, Extreme, Foundry, you know, all these other guys. But but I mean, couldn't you be doing if if traffic patterns change? A little bit slower than on a per packet basis, mm -hmm. on a more thing measured in some time scale. You can compute. I mean, couldn't you be doing these things you know, a lot in software a lot faster? So that to have to track the change in the millisecond order. You could, you could. Okay, you, it turns out that the hardware does have hooks to measure things, right? There, but, uh, but, and so in fact, we might leverage of some of these in the. But even then, even changing the router software, although it's not a five-year period, Cisco iOS trains are still two and a half years. Right? It, everything is slow. It's just sad. I mean, probably I don't know. Microsoft is probably not much faster, right? But it, it doesn't. It's not that easy to get a product out there. And uh, so, but but it's really shocking when you see the real numbers. And so right now, nothing changes, right? Now this one though, it's going to require. You to actually add some kind of layer right over here, which which does require a loadable kind of module into your kernel or something like that. Which in Linux we know how to do. We assume you can do it in Windows too, right? And and so so what is this? What is this? What is this thing? Dave, just a second. I mean, you said you know, uh, in wireless you have less bandwidth and, and wireless can keep up there in software, but the, but there is a reverse problem there, which is harder here. So that we did made the assumption that you know which property wants to get what ratios. Mm -hmm. And so you don't have those sort of things in models. You actually have to, I mean, you have to adapt very quickly as to you know, what application is taking how much and then you go through that. Otherwise, you either run out of, either you starve things or you just run out of the links which are not being utilized. So I mean, it's sort of a. But I think fundamentally, though. The uh, big problem is still exactly the same. It's just that where do you, which, which are the things that you can tune which you can tune. Right. So here you do you feel that it's hard for, I mean, people don't want to actually you know, provide some simple guidance to the network as to this property is more important than this one. That, if you don't do that, it's like there's, the network has no basis for doing anything, right? Actually, it, it, yeah. it could have one guy completely consuming the network, and it's fine as far as you're concerned because you didn't give me any sense of importance. So unless you, so the point is you have to give me some information as to your relative intent for the use of the network. Well, it sort of depends on, on what it is for. So for example, if you think of Bing, for example, or, yeah. or you know, yeah. uh, which is like a big property, and yes, it definitely needs more priority. Yes. But if you look at tailored properties, it's also the data centers are running, which are quite a few of them. You can't do this sort of thing, right? Because then you're, you're bit, how are you selecting which is the right one, unless you put money into the equation or you do something else. Right. So what you might do is do at least, for a start, do the big ones, right? And then everybody else falls into one bucket. So it's still better because you get predictable service from the people who are making you revenue. And yet you're sharing the same network. And you know, your competitor Google has all the same problems because even they really likes to like to run on one physical network. And they're beginning to find a lot well, of the same issues. If you're doing big property, I'm not even sure why you would share it with anybody else. They do though. A lot of people do. And uh, yeah. not I, always, yeah. Yeah, I mean data mining versus ads versus the verticals versus I mean so within the property, you're saying different There's things. There's always different different properties. Properties. Yeah. 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 And imagine this, you know, CFO has certain queries, right? Yeah. Yeah. Plus, there are backups going on, right? The people have to do backups. Right? And, and you know, you probably want lower priority, but you want to make sure there is some bandwidth so that the backup. Okay, so the idea is very simple here, right? You go ahead and measure the rate, and you feed it back to H1, right? And now the I, you need a little bit of a dynamic algorithm. You have to be a little careful, right? It's not. Uh, so what happens is that so this guy is pumping at five. He's dropping his packets, but this guy measures one. He feeds it back. Now, what should this guy be allowed to send at? It turns out that you can't let him send at exactly one. If you do, then he'll never grow, right? So you have to sort of, because, you know, uh, if, if the network bandwidth did increase, right, you want to allow him to grow. Because and once he sends at one, he's only going to receive at one, and that's going to be maintained forever. So in order to do that, you let him go at a slightly higher rate, like 20%, right? So he goes at 1.2. So now if the network bandwidth suddenly opens up, Right? You know, you, you're going to see 1.21, 1.21. If the network bandwidth goes up, he's going to suddenly measure himself as 1.2, in which case he goes up to 1.4. And so he keeps, he keeps climbing. So you want a grow, uh, an ability for him to grow, right? So 
the rule is that when you, when you come here, right, if the bandwidth received is higher, uh, whatever the bandwidth is, you actually go down to something like 20% of that, right? And there's a little bit of care you need to take to make sure that the right thing happens, things don't, uh, but, but those are all in the paper. So if you, uh, I don't want to talk about the mechanism. Yes, Srikant. What if a new property comes in or rates need to change? So a new property comes in, what you have to do is, so here is the configuration required, right? Ideally what you would like is some kind of open flow or some other software where it's centrally done, but it has to go to every router, right? And basically add that new, new uh, thing in the, in the DRR weights. And it can be done, but right now we do it by going to each one and physically configuring it, which is more painful. But it seems to me that that level of network management should happen in the future. And if that happens, then you can do it from one console. Okay, so it's not that hard conceptually, but today it's painful because you have to log into every console and do it. You just and add one DRR weight to every exactly router. to every router, right? So right now we we, we don't want to even know where you're using it. You know, maybe you could probably gain by saying only do it in these routers, but right now we think the simplest way is just go to every router and do it, right? So you don't even bother, right? This is a very simple model. But by the way, even this level of configuration, when we talk to the Azure guys. No, 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 <laughs> you, know, you don't want to do it. And so, so it's interesting that, you know, that, that we thought it wasn't such a big deal, but, but for real running networks, even this is a problem, okay? So the sender adjusts its rate. The rate throttle limits to actually slightly over one, and, uh, and, and then you have to allow for fast acquisition, okay? So now, then we started saying, all right, we've done all of these things, and they kind of work, they give us the policy we want, they handle UDP, but maybe we want... This, this definition, this hierarchical maximum fair sharing has a number of things that we don't, are not as flexible as we would like. So for example, it treats every connection alike. Like I think some of you said, well, what if the connections, you want some servers to have more, right? And we can think of even weirder policies, okay? So, so here is, uh, uh, you know, like two flows, right? And the idea would be that imagine what you wanted normally when you, when you, when, if you have the same weights, right? The bandwidths are shared. Uh, sorry, I'm sleep. We need three for this. Maybe there are th is there a third one. Okay. So imagine there are three flows, right? Now, normally it means if they're all three active, right? Each of them gets a third, 3.33. Does that make sense? Right? Okay. But it means that if one of them is totally idle, the other guys share it equally, five five. So in some sense, there's a minimum, right, that is specified by one weight, but the excess is also specified by the same weight. Maybe you want two different weights, because some applications require a guaranteed fixed amount of bandwidth, but maybe they don't require any excess bandwidth at all. So maybe you want two weights. One weight for sharing the, you know, the bandwidth if everybody is using it, that gives you a certain minimum bandwidth, but if any excess comes around, you share it in a different set of weights. It's, you know, it's, we can think of reasons why that might be interesting, because there are certain apps, you very predictable bandwidth, why give them any excess? Access, right? And, and, or backups, you want to make sure that they have a definite amount, but no more, right? Oh, actually, backups is wrong. Probably they want to be elastic. So we could think of, uh, so, if, so in this case, if they're all equal, they'll be 3.3. But if you actually had an excess weight of 2 and 1, then actually the numbers would actually change, and the guy who had the bigger excess weight would have, when, when the green was not, was not, uh, was not, was, was not uh, sending, then he would get, the red would get a little more because he had a higher excess weight. He would get 5.5, and and, and this guy would only get 4.4. They still sum up to 10, but they, they use it in a different proportion. So we're just trying to push the model a little bit and say, you know, if we push it a little bit, can we get more flexibility? Right now, maximum fare sort of pushes your bandwidth things into certain regions, and we'd like to sort of expand that space. Okay? Once you do that, we quickly realize that we can't rely on TCP because TCP has no flexibility to look at these two weights. We can't rely on UDP, right? And so what we, we, we realized that we needed a centralized bandwidth allocator. So how does the centralized bandwidth allocator work, right? So it's, it's interesting. Uh, so the network administrator assigns weights, right? And now what happens is that we go ahead and uh, somewhere we have to measure the traffic matrix. We have to sort of see for each property, how much is it trying to send to everybody else? And that's where we might be able to com commandeer the, the access switches because they do, have, they do have a certain amount of rate measurements in the hardware. If not, you'd have to do it at the, at the software, at the, uh, at the okay? So, uh, uh, or the end servers. And once you get that, you basically send this traffic matrix periodically, right? Probably not any sooner than 100, millise 100 milliseconds because this is a lot of work, right? And you send it to your centralized QS computation engine. And based on that, this guy predicts your demands for the next, because he has to predict because you might be growing, right? And then you compute 
this or anything you want to, you know, more fancy policies, right, from the weighted bisection bandwidths. And now you go ahead and send back the, current, the rates to be used for the next one, and now you have to rely on, 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 on uh, what are known as token bucket limiters at the routers to make sure that if somebody, a UDP flow is being given only one, it stays at one. So th the only advantage of this compared to all this other stuff is it allows you much more general policies. Now you're, you're, you're free to do anything you want. You can go ahead and give some servers more. You can do you know, different weights. And it's kind of not as, uh, it looks weird, centralized bandwidth, because bandwidth changes so fast. But we're, we're hoping for, to, to track only somewhat uh, smaller, uh, coarser time scale changes in bandwidth. Right? And think, if you think of lots of what's going on in networking research, they've moved to centralized routing control platforms. And so this is another step in that direction. OK, now there's lots of questions. Now I'll take all of them. Yeah. Dissemination of this information, like even in the like you were pointing out the sequential nature of this information. Like what if you were allowed to kind of so we just really need to get it to one guy. So I'm not sure we need broadcast as much. We're kind of like an in-cast, right? They're all going to one guy. All the traffic measured at the edges is going to one centralized computation. Oh, you could do it in a distributed fashion instead. Is that right? But then everybody has to do that computation. And that computation, you know, we've done it. It's, it's, uh, it, takes, it takes a few hundred minutes. So we would we'd rather do it in one place and send it seems to us. Okay, so for the simpler model, there is nothing being sent anyway. It's just automatically leveraging on TCP, and except for the so, so there's no. The what if we can talk about that? But the what that's a very well studied problem, right? So it's twenty years old. So it's, yes, go ahead. I was going to ask a question, but we have to sure. ask Eric about his paper. So there was a wireless paper recently that was very similar to this. Possibly. So Eric, what a comment? I don't know. The wireless paper. Yeah, I mean, we did something somewhat similar in that we were basically doing a centralized computation engine. Yeah. We would determine the rates that each of these endpoints can see. That's good. I'm glad there's, so we should definitely cite that. Stuff. There's actually, um, yeah. uh, on that, this quote, I had a lot of work and a lot of the things you've actually mentioned yeah. in the honest community because yeah. they've dealt with this situation um, from years, yeah, yeah. actually. Yeah. And the problem is, 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 I mean, I was trying to think about like, the assumptions you're making versus the assumptions they have made. There are differences there, which, which is, which says that's okay, it's fine to do. So one question I have for you is that in order to validate these thesis, right, in order to say that this your thesis system really works, you really have to look at the traffic and you really have to look at these properties and how far these flows last and you know, how long it is. Without that, this is not very useful, right? You, you have to first establish, because you said there is a there is some sort of um, upper limit to how fast you can configure these routers or how much you want to do, how, much, how fast you do computation in the central server to decide what kind so of bandwidth. I think the statistical multiplexing, I agree. It depends on the real traffic. But the fact that you can guarantee certain minimums, right, that can be established without any regard to any traffic. That's true, but you... Right now, you don't have that. You don't have any firewalls at all. I think that's the first thing to establish, that it can be done without changing all these routers. Well, but you were saying, you know, and somewhere earlier on, you were saying, and I wanted to ask if you were saying that I don't give, for example, you're getting one, I won't give one, I'll give 1 1.2 or something, right? Right. To make sure that right. it has room to expand. Right. And the question to me was, well, if supposing you're asking it that 1.2 is fine, What's it doing to TCP? I mean, I don't, it's I don't, not. I don't it's, it's, it's just basically taking a little bit more than its actual allocated share so that it has a little. And this is a common thing that is used a lot. So that's not such a big deal. The DRL does it. And, and so I think you know, you're getting worried about a very small thing. That one is not a big deal. I agree that really, ideally, we need to have a big data center, see how this works, to measure the statistical multiplex. I would love to do that. But, but that requires about, you know, help from people who are actually doing it. So, I, yeah. I just worry about anything that you take to some central thing, to the computation, push it back down. Yeah, I, I agree. About the timing no, no, no. So that, that's, that's a good point. Okay? So the timing of that one, that is scary. Right, because it really depends on prediction, smoothness, and all those things. And in fact, VL2 actually is scary. The, num the, the, the things in VL2 say that things change so fast, so it actually, you know, it's actually depressing to, uh, for, for this kind of thing. So, but nevertheless, I think we just put it in for completeness. Right? So if you don't like that, the first two are very fast run. Today. Sorry, uh, I think Srikant? So um, I want to just push back on the centralized thing. Even in enterprise data centers, yeah. where probably the number of properties is static, yeah. uh, the number of hosts that a centralized controller has to tackle at any one point of time is substantial. 
and there seems to be no good way of uh, splicing it. I mean, we, we, we actually did some algorithmic work there. We didn't talk about it. So what we did was we basically did splice it, right, on an edge switch to edge switch basis, and then we did the we did the calculation sort of recursively on top for all the guys sharing. That helped a lot. The complex, but you're right. Others, you take host to host. The number of pairs is so massive, right? It's, it's roughly an n square kind of algorithm. So, so, and and we did a lot of work to make this fast. So again, that's something you know. But you're right. Fundamentally, you know, it's very here. These are distributed things that are doing it automatically, and so that so the speed of this is another huge issue. So right? just to clarify, uh, when you spliced it, yeah. the distributed versions of the centralized controller have. It's not distributed. It's not dis not actually. It's not dis I just we did just a centralized thing, but we basically we didn't splice it in the way maybe you meant. We basically uh, we divided the, com the, the there is an n square in the complexity, right? If you make n the number of hosts, it becomes very large. So we try to reduce that to order n uh, m, where m is the number of uh, of edge switch edge switch pairs. Compute trunks between edge switches. Yes, exactly. And then 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 the last thing on the trunk is easy, right? That that's an easy computation. Sure. So we kind of just just break it up into equivalent. Just, these are just methods of of reducing the centralized complexity. Sorry. So I guess what, what we're thinking is that, you know, Alan Hahn wrote this great there, who said, be distributed, and it's as if it's centralized. It's, it's as if you ran the wire filling out there. We all love that. And all we need is TCP and DRR. And so it's hard to give that up now. I mean, why, why can't we have a new uh, in-system-based mechanism that doesn't require the you could, but now you'd have to change all the TCPs and all these other <coughs> things like that to do that. Oh, you mean right? So, so, the, and so, so and I personally, right? I wouldn't do this centralized thing. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, it just—it turns out we did it in the reverse way. We thought of that first, and then we came down to these simpler methods, and we felt we felt uh, hard pressed to give up on our intellectual investment. So, so we put it in anyway, and we and we just uh, and we just wrote a set. So, but, but I think I agree. If I was building something, there's no way I would do it. Right. <laughs> it's, it's way too complicated. So, yeah, sorry? I find it funny. Yeah, I shouldn't be saying things like this. Yeah, but I'll get into trouble if the, if the paper reviewers here. Well, no, no, no. no. I, I, okay. I mean, so, so you talk about wireless. This has been the central problem in traffic engineering for, for 20 years, yeah, yeah. right? And, and basically, what it's all come down to is predictability. Yes. That if you can act, right, you're doing emissions control. And if you can predict the required share, then you have all the time in the world, and the centralized algorithm is the right way to do it. And, you, there were studies done. You will get, I think the, this is like 30% better than a fully distributed version and how close you get to optimal, right? And, but then it's arguable what your definition of optimal is, right? Because now the ISP, you know, the standard definitions are least used uh, link should be. And it's like, even that, it's not clear for the data center. Is that the right one? So it's like, there's so many things like that too in the end, right? That's why, that's why I sort of asked you about your evaluation metric. So, you know, when we think about these things, we sort of get stuck in exactly that element that we have to have loads and loads of traffic that we can look at that we can actually kind of work with <coughs> It's fair, and we did. So from that perspective, I was asking, like, I mean, I, 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 maybe I didn't ask it crystal, but I was asking now. How did you evaluate this? Okay. So we'll, we'll talk about how we evaluate. So basically, we built a test bed for us, a small, right? So we definitely did not have the advantage of large scale, real traffic. And so we had no handle on the, tra on, on the statistical monitoring. But we did, were able to show the isolation, right? And on real, and, and also the important thing is we took real routers. We took fulcrum switches, and we built a real test. So that was kind of nice that this hypothesis that you only have to configure the thing was correct. So that's really what we did. Plus, we started up certain properties with lots and lots of connections, and we said it didn't matter. Once you said the weights, they could do you know jack, but you couldn't you couldn't uh, you couldn't affect it. So that's what we did in our Did we? Would it be better to to run it on a real thing? Yes, but you know that's a different set of. You know, we did talk to Srikant briefly of getting him around here, trying to do this, on, but it didn't happen. Yeah, so go ahead. What about, I mean, a lot of these bandwidth allocation problems end up that you slice up the bandwidth correctly, but then you have the problems that the per connection response times vary so much that nobody even studies that, right? In your, that, I mean, sometimes for certain connections, they degrade yeah. drastically. Yeah. In your case, I mean, was one of the metrics response times ever studied or? Yes, so response time is, you, know, you try to see how fast the CVNs go up, right? For, for these things. And maybe we were, we were restricting ourselves in our apps. We, we, it's also, we needed, a, we do need a richer set of apps. We tend to study a lot of Hadoop-like apps, 
Which right. Are so, so they, they generally, and even they, they're very sensitive. They have a certain phase, a reduced phase, and a map phase. And the the uh, certain the sort phase, for example, is much more bandwidth intensive. The other phase, it doesn't really matter. So, so we did actually see that sometimes when we give twice the bandwidth weight to an, to one app or the other, it doesn't complete its job twice as fast simply because there's other phases where it's not bandwidth limit. Right. Right? So, so there's a lot of that in the paper where you're actually trying to see the effect on application level performance on, on, with all of these things. But, but what's the statistical multiplexing gains across large crowds? No, no, we, we don't have any sense. Oops. Sorry. Turn this off. Excuse me. Okay. Go ahead. I believe that the number of queues that you can simultaneously run in the is small. So do you have something to do when the number of properties you have no. is large? So, so I think Srikanth and Ming are definitely interested in Azure, right, where the number is more like 10,000. And this time, so there are two differences in what they are doing. I think one is that you can no longer hide under this thing like, well, you have 100, roughly 100 I think you can get now, a lot, in a lot of, Fulcrum had 100. Right, and so uh, 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 and so then you have to find some way to extend it when you don't have that. Right? That's number one. And number two, you have to worry about more adversarial people. Right? Now, our stuff actually, we're not assuming. Ad the reason why it helps to not assume adver non-adversarial behavior is if one guy notices that his bandwidth is being stolen when he's not using it, right? And it takes a little bit of time, however little, right, milliseconds to get it back. That he might game the system by saying, "I'll just send idle traffic." Right? So certainly in an ISP world, you would worry about that. In an Azure world, you would worry about that. Right? But but here in an enterprise setting, maybe that was less. So so you have a different set of problems. You have to worry about adversariality. You have to worry about scaling to larger numbers, and that's why we restricted <coughs> to, to this. Okay. So uh, so uh, I don't know why. All right. Yeah. So right. Uh, the uh, um, yeah. So then. So although we had this max, maximum fair notion, right? if you talk about applications, it's not really clear what it means for applications to share the network. So, so we, we're not entirely sure right, how you actually define this, this notion of application sharing. Should you think of it as a super com And what about multipath routing? Look, there's a ton of work on maximum fair share with multipath, and it's all messy. right? They come out with NP-complete algorithms. And it's, it's, it's a tariff. And what is the, one of the nice things of the evaluation which we did, which was surprising to us, is just for the heck of it, we'd run this mechanism with a simple amount of multipath. And it seemed to do the right thing. It seemed to take the aggregate bisection bandwidth and share it proportional to the weights. And that was nice, because that's not exactly obvious given the theoretical results in the field. So again, we don't, know, we don't have any explanation for it, but, but at least in simple cases, simple data center cases, maybe it's the topology and, uh, and that it seemed to work well with. So um, uh, do I have? I must have had some slides on evaluation. Oh, yeah, same. OK, so here is, here is a quick thing, right? So uh, the group allocation, the TCP thing, you know, you do require configuration at switches. It's very fast, right? But it's only TCP flows, and it's only hierarchical max min. The rate throttling, it now basically allows UDP, but it now goes up. Because you have to measure the UDP rates, and measurement is at least a few. And it's only hierarchical max min. And the centralized allocation is slower. And it's probably more general allocation policies, and it's not clear how scalable it is. So you know, it's it's true that you have to worry about you know when you're going to do it at large scale, you really have to worry about it. Okay, so how did we implement this? We basically uh, we, we we had a, a Fulcrum a 10 gig switch, and we were able to sort of configure it as lots of smaller switches, which. Uh, uh, we were able to then sort of emulate subswitches and emulate topologies. And this was a topology we were much more interested in because it was multipath. All was very simple, right? And so uh, uh, we, we had to do certain things to, and this too, it's all in the paper on how we actually uh, ma made all this experiment work. But, uh, but so fundamentally, without net, so what, let me try to re read what we did here. Because uh, so what we did was we had two applications, a red and a green. Uh, a red and a green, and I'm, uh, let's see. And, and so let's take this one, for example. This is the simplest one. And so the, the, what we did for the red and the, the, the red application, they were both Hadoop applications, except that uh, they were both doing sorts, except that one of them had uh, eight slaves and the other one had four. 
right? Let me just think, where is this? And I should have had this on this slide. And so one of them had a total of 96 maps, eight, eight per slave, and 96 reducers, while the other one used uh, a smaller amount of reducers, four per slave. So it turns out that if you don't use this, right, the person with more slaves will open up more TCP connections. And on, on all the bottleneck links, he gets a much bigger share of the bandwidth. Right? And it's pretty straightforward that since you're actually allocating based on the application and not on the connections, that you will get uh, this kind of you know, even behavior. And there's a lot more to it. There's a lot more description on does the applications complete faster? In the end, even if you give them equal bandwidth, they don't all. But, and so the, uh, and so, but, but that's the kind of spirit of some of those. Uh, of, but the most interesting thing is exactly, roughly the same thing happened in the multipath. There was a few edge effects that we, were, we are still trying to figure out what happened. But in the multipath, case, if you go back to the picture, right, what we would really like is, in some sense, the bisection bandwidth has gone up to two gig now, because there are two sets of parts. And we'd like this two gig to be shared among these two applications, right, in proportion to their weights. And that seems to happen. And that's the thing that we're most pleased about, because ECMP is in the, alive and in the data center, and you can't wait for theory to catch up and you know, all of these things to catch. And Han's result, all these results don't really apply to all those cases. So, so maybe there's some new theory to be done, right? But, but we, are, we are hopeful that maybe in simple data center topology, this simple thing will do the right thing. Okay? So that's roughly where we are. And I think uh, if I had to summarize what we are trying to do is we're really just trying to figure this out. <laughs> you know, you know, what is the right notion? It seems like a pressing problem. We need to define it. Somebody needs to define it. And we're taking a first cut at a definition, hierarchical maximum fair sharing. So maybe there's some contribution in just defining what you mean. Right? If you don't know what you mean, right, you can't argue about which is better than the other. Okay? And uh, then you, we're taking the simplest possible mechanisms right, that can do what we mean. One with you know, a generalization of Hans' result right, to, to doing it per property as opposed to per connection. And then we fix it for UDP and then maybe generalize it to this other stuff. Right? So, uh, so th and, th and that's really where we're at. We're, we're not satisfied with the whole thing. We think there's more to be done, and, but it's our first, uh, our first cut at this. And it turns out in the Azure environment, we talked to the Azure guys, you know, there's a number of issues, right? Even the simple, like, no change to existing router is actually configuration. They don't want that, right? And so, so maybe there's some new creative things, and we've talked about some of those things. The Balaji's approach, which is going ahead and uh, sending these QCN requires modification of switches, which we're not sure will actually work uh, in the near future, right? And these guys have a totally different approach. Go ahead. Sorry, I saw your axis was in thousands of seconds. What's your convergence time? Uh, you will start. Do you have a feel for it? In the implementation? Yeah. Uh, I'll have to look up. I, I don't remember, you know, all of these things. I, they, uh, the con sorry, the, what was in thousands of seconds? The x-axis was in ten, thousands of seconds. So can't you tell? No, no, no. So this one, they would not give you any feel for convergence. So convergence, you had to measure with cement, right, to see how fast the cement got to some crew, because the bandwidth doesn't tell you anything, right? And these measurements were, I think even the bandwidth measurements were done in aggregates of like maybe 100 milliseconds. So they, that's way too coarse. The measurement itself is too coarse to tell you how fast it converges. Even the bandwidth stabilizes, you can say the CBN has stabilized. Yeah, mm -hmm. it couldn't tell. No, so that's a totally separate experiment, right? So the, uh, so yeah, so, but generally it's roughly a few TCB kind of, because these are very simple topologies. Now you could argue in more complex topologies, it would be more complicated. Yeah. So, but that's not shown by these. Because these are just coarse bandwidth measurements that we managed to switch. Uh, we managed to put in something to measure this everywhere, but it's very coarse measurements. Well, it does, I mean, it does look like a ringing behavior going on. So there's some dynamics that persist for several yeah. seconds. Yeah. So, so, and, and there are some explanations of why some of those happen. Part of the ringing behavior is because the application itself changes phases, yeah. right? It goes from sort to, so remember, you know, we, are, we have a real application running. It's not like iperf running in, in a constant thing. So, so definitely there's a big change in dynamics towards the, and, and if you see that, right, that'll explain why, you know, like these things change because they, they actually sort of switch gears and from sort to map and, and things like that. So, so there is something that has to be explained that way. So, so that's all I have, and uh, I, you know, like, uh, I'm just happy to open it up for any, you know, like uh, anybody's ideas, any, because we're still, you know, trying to figure this out. And uh, and Albert, you want to start the discussion? Yeah. Oh. We have five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, should we thank the speaker first? Yes. Let's do it. <laughs> right. So I think the. Um, the most interesting part is uh, the requirements for a solution. The requirements? For a solution. Yes. 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 And uh, uh, it 
it seems like you require um, intelligent job placement. Seems like. Okay. In the end, yeah. Because we expose locality in some sense. And yeah, so if your neighbors influence what you get. Yes. yes. And uh, um, so that's very different from your kind of model, right? The BL2 model where you basically get rid of all locality, right? But it seems to me that if you had a BL2 model, then simply you could really have very nicely a model of just, you could, you could sort of give the model to everybody that they have a big switch. Mm -hmm. And now there's totally no locality because it's burnt out of the system by your, by your mechanisms. And now it's much simpler because the model is you have just a big switch and you have certain you know, bandwidths that are equal everywhere. Well, we still have to do your rate throttling thing, though, because basically the V2 uh, results all depend on traffic domain host model. It's yeah. basically Kirchhoff's current law, yeah, which yeah. is exactly what your rate throttling yeah, does. Yeah, yeah. You're not pushing more traffic into yeah. the network yeah. than can possibly come out of it. Yeah. Um, so even with the V2 network, there will still be, uh, you will still depend on where you're, who you're collocated with, because your bandwidth at your door or the last link to your Switch. I see. It will depend on that. Yeah. Well, no. If you have a subscription, if you have a VM and you have you're co-located on a server with another VM that has hundred flows coming in, mm -hmm. it, it matters inside a single blade, but not between Tor and blade, because right. there is no over subscription. Right. If you happen to be co-located with very bad VM on the same blade, then you're you're stuck. Well, but that okay. But that problem you can fix with hierarchy. No. On that one host. Yeah. But I think they're, they're thinking of fixing that with another level of flow control, right? Which is uh, like it's VM based. Each VM gets a certain amount of bandwidth. Right. right, right. Simple yeah. rate limit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I think Windows is putting that in, correct? Yeah. Well, well the way it's limiting is there. Did you say you can solve that problem with this? No, I mean only that problem, not the congestion inside the network. We are really bothered about bad co-location at the same place. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, Albert, you had a thought. Do you want to finish it? Yeah. <coughs> the other thing is that, um, that we talked about, well, if they're big, you can give them separate infrastructure. Yes. That's not easy. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, uh, you, you don't know how much you're going to. Uh, I mean, the whole idea of uh, why these data centers are going to be cheap is, is uh, you know, filling valleys, that box, and stuff like that. It's not allocating for the max. Yes. So even the big guys don't know yes. quite how much they need. Yes. And, and, and if, you, if you force them to, if you don't provide any mechanism like this, they'll have to buy uh, separate uh, local provision clusters. So, you know, you'll get, say, you'll buy 20% more of a huge number. <coughs> So in your paper, and I've, I've, I've tried to understand the relation in the host model, right? You guys were also doing some kind of multiplexing where the original paper, the AT&T paper, yeah. right? So how does, I mean, do some of those mechanisms apply? Well, that was adaptive throttling. Yeah. Um, and was emission control. <laughs> yeah, so maybe. Maybe it's similar, right, in the end, yeah. yeah. Mm. So, Go going back to your min, um, everybody gets a min. Yes. The min is only the one over the sum of the weights. Exactly. Times your weight. Yeah. Times, times, times the, the bandwidth of the path. Times your weight times the bandwidth of the That's the shape. Yeah. Exactly. <coughs> that one is guaranteed for you regardless of where you move around, which I think I find that helpful because it gives you a certain floor, right? And now you can migrate and do everything. Now, if, now, you, now on top of that, you can start saying if locality is visible and you have a network, now I can have an optimization problem. Where should I locate my VMs to get the... Yeah. Go ahead, Dan. Yeah, I'm, just, I'm trying to figure out how much that does solve some of your problems. So today, if, I, if I'm in some overscribed network and it really matters where I am, yeah. I'm playing all these tricks to figure out how to get to be in the right places. Yeah. With your system, I'm still going to play all these tricks to figure out whether I want to rent to be bigger here or be bigger there, right? Right, but I think it's still... I think it's still nice to be able to be sure that you have a certain bandwidth that works regardless of what other people are doing and regardless of where you're going to move. To me, that's reassuring because it gives you a certain minimum level of performance that, that you can regardless of other people's gaming. And the, the other thing is that oftentimes when you look at these new jobs, I'm sure you have done the studies, um, the time to complete the job is defined by the outliers. Right? So, so you've got good locality for a bunch of your compute nodes and your data storage nodes, but there's someone way far out there that you had to fetch data from because you couldn't get it local. And so having a good amount of job time depends on having good communication that comes from. Yeah, but, but on, on that note, like, 
So the outlier, let's say you have a phase and you have these guys working parallel, you want the slow guys, the slow guys, let's say, are the ones that are limiting you, right? If you end up on a machine that has all other kinds of applications on it, I mean, your, your fraction will be proportional to that and will be quite low of the bandwidth. No, no, no. I think the assumption here is that uh, you have, uh, it's not so much, yeah. You have a worst case thing, right? We're not talking about a lot of properties. You're talking about lots and lots of properties that is different. But if you're, if you're talking a certain number, regardless, you, there's a certain minimum which assumes that everybody is on your machine and on your link at the same time. That's your floor. Everybody being every... Every other property is there at the yeah. same time, right? Yeah, oh, that's, so okay, that's your floor, okay, yeah. right? So that's like... Need not be. It depends okay. on how big you are and how much revenue you get. Like, so if you're half the revenue of the company, you get half the bandwidth always. It's like yeah. you don't have to worry about an experimental person coming in and destroying your stuff. Yeah, but yeah, you know, yeah. like, and, and, and various other things. Okay. So. But but it does sound like if, if you could pay twice the fee to get to increase your, your ratio, yeah. or you could yeah. open up ten VMs and throw out the nine worst ones. Yeah. That that second approach might give you much better yeah, reward. Yeah. And so you're still be playing all these other games. Yes. Maybe. Yeah, I mean, without a, without a network with one-to-one -one over subscription, you're going to play with full count, and you're going to have to put the schedule on games. Or there's going to be there's going to be upside to playing those games. So really, if people are wondering, is is there a market for over subscribed networks? If you if you market in the sense of what you're doing, think there's real money people are paying. Uh, if it so. That's an interesting question. Yeah. Will they pay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Will, so will they pay, I think, in the future, will they pay for oversubscribed networks or will they pay for this mechanism on oversubscribed networks? Um, I was wondering if it's more general. I think it's more general than that. I don't. I think the oversubscribed networks, if, if it's n not oversubscribed, you still, uh, you still... So no, you, you know what you're getting. Which is a nice thing. Right. I think it's the predictability that I'm hoping is something that people will, will want in the future. Yeah, so. so even with the VM, I mean, to some extent, you have some notion of you know a certain minimum amount of performance, yes. have, right? And that I think is it's comforting, right? Although all, most of the time you get a lot more, right? but uh, but I think having the business models are still being experimented with. I mean, on some Amazon VMs, there is no guarantee, right? It, it's like a one gigahertz processor, but no, it's, not. it's not. I see. I see. So, uh, I see because of paging or some other strange yeah. thing that... Uh, they, they do a lot better than they do if you take something out of the box and run it, but they don't do fair share. There are games you can play and get more than your fair share on EC2, although you do a lot better than if you run, say, Zen just out of the box on a machine. That is horrible in terms of how it fair shares stuff. Really? Um, like three or four to one difference from fair share easily. And what about EC2? EC2 is a lot better than that. Two to one, maybe? Um, my understanding and the noise. Different. I think, I think and the, you, you can push it statistically, but I don't think it's two to one. I think it's like one and a half to one from fair share. Again, I think once you go to the Azure model, you know, it's, it, it is a yeah. different setting, you know, because people are playing games. Here, I think it's accounting and engineering, and I, you know, I, I, I you know, they're all reporting to one CEO. I'm, I'm hoping, <laughs> you know, like, and so, so that's, uh, uh, and that's, and so there, it's reasonable then if one, like in customers, it's very hard, right? If I'm not using my hundred megabits and I've paid for it, you mean you're using it? And actually, the argument is when you're not using it, I'll get yours too. But that's still a little hairy, right? Can you imagine an ISP that kind of? But in the company setting, I think that's. A little more plausible, right? In an enterprise. Setting. So, so we're still feeling this out. But thank you for your comments. And uh, yes, yeah. We just want things. Even if you are such looking at the links at the fast level information, right? If you sort of get this transient congestion at the at the switches of on the edge router, right? So even if you have bandwidth allocation, you will never have a stable set of the system, right? So even if you are allocating bandwidth, you will still drop things, right? Yes. So what I mean, what your assumption really is by by doing this well, at least a minimum share of allocation, and you're sort of making the assumption that things, things were stable, then I can guarantee this end-to-end -end path um, from endpoint A to endpoint B. But if things get, you know, for example, your, your earlier work on essentially, things can get bad even within a single router, right? yes. from, from its ingress to its egress. Yes, right? yes. So can now, when you don't have stability in the system, yes. right? then even if you're allocating bandwidth this way, radical maximum, we're sharing and things can still go bad in a, in a 
constantly flux. So what we like about this actually, and that's actually an interesting point. So this is an point I don't I think I made, but the nice thing about this is the floor is normally imagine that you had alternate paths, right? Like and you had backup paths. And so what would happen is if you want to do reservation, you would have to reserve on the alternate parts as well because you never know if you'd use it, and which is totally wasteful. Here, you go ahead and do these kind of weights on these alternate parts, but you're not using them. Other people are free to use them, right? So, you know, which is kind of nice because in some sense, you're less wasteful of these. So if failure occurs, you don't actually have to propagate anything because the weights are already there everywhere. You go to the alternate path, it's waiting for you. It's already pre-allocated for you. So I'm not quite answering your question, but it did suggest something that, you know, like even if there's a network is churning a lot and routing is, you know, is changing a lot, right, from one part to another, this stuff is totally independent because, you know, what, at least in the simple model when it's configured, it just, it doesn't change. It just, it, it has its weights and it's ready for you. You switch from one part to another, it automatically allocates the bandwidth because you just pre-configured every router when you started. But, but it's hard to write guarantees about loss over reasonable periods of time, for instance. Uh, I think that was what we were asking. Well, I think that's one part of the question, right? Yeah. Can, can a few losses can really, you know, sure. create a havoc in the system, right? So essentially, do you now become sensitive? Because there's no issue of stability in the system right. per se, right? Right. Right. So even if you you're, you have these weights, but if there is some notion of transience, then what, what what would your ideal behavior be? What would you like? I, mean, I, I essentially, I guess. Because until I know that, I don't know how to compare it to you know what it's doing. Well, I guess the, the, the sense really is that you know how robust is it? it's basically a control system, right? Yes. So you're doing traffic traffic engineering um, on the links. Then what's your notion of stability and what's your notion of sort of the convergence timing? Right? So those that's, portion that's of the that to it's, get to George's question. Uh, so first, I, I have to go and I apologize, but that's exactly why we wanted to have this discussion. We wanted to find the ideal system, what we want, <laughs> and uh, that's. A great pushback, and then and then adapt the mechanism uh, to that. And, uh, I think the big question is what is the question really? You know, really that is the struggle that because this is a whole new area, and you know everybody has this intuitive notion that something has to be done, right? But the question is what needs to be done, right? And uh, and what would users want? Similar question, right? So yeah. I'm essentially saying in terms of robustness of your system, so yeah. you have some notion of ideal, and which may change from your system to my system. But if you have a few transient events in the system, I would say the first two are not. No, the first one is to is very robust, right? The second one, maybe a little less. The third one is probably not robust at all. You know, if you have tremendous changes in in traffic, it's it's just going to be it's, it's centralized. It takes a long. It's going to rely on predictability. It's screwed, you know. And so, so that's my rough guess as to the answers. But, uh, but I mean, I'm, I'm still worried that you know your coarseness in play tricks. I'm trying to say yeah. that. DRR helps with that. I mean, if it's coarseness, you know, for example, in the field and over very short can they now still trigger these events even in a relatively stable system? DRR helps a lot with that. It turns out if you just turn on DRR with reasonable bins for DRR, that like the intuitive, and I, this is, it was hard for me to write my head the first time I started playing with this, that goes away really quickly, which is to say that you don't end up with small flow, it, it, you only screw with people in your own DRR bin, mm -hmm. and so you can cause really nasty things to happen to people in your own DRR bin, but if you've said that there, that's yourself, then that problem mostly goes away, is my understanding. Um, and certainly when I run experiments with DRR turned on, it's, it helps a lot. It's certainly the most robust, right? There's no moving yeah. parts. I mean, you set your configuration, and as long as the configuration is taken, yeah. It's not like a control system, that part. That's, that's why I said the first one is wrong. The second and third, they're measuring, they're going to, I, I, I hear you, and I feel your pain there, but not in the first one. Right, so, 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 so thanks. Is it time for DC UDP? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. DC, 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 that's an so intern for, it might be your project. Yeah. What's the, hey, you're done, DC. Yeah.